Hello, my name is Tavy, and welcome to the first of many videos where I'm going to be bringing you some out-of-the-box thinking and consciousness expanding ideas. The information I'm going to be sharing with you is by all means only my interpretation through what I've learned and what I've experienced over the years. However, my aim here is for you to see your own reflections and your own patterns within these concepts. And don't worry if you get confused or none of this makes any sense at all, because what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be placing some links in the description below so that you can do your own research or you can just simply Google it, because there's plenty of information on these concepts out there. Besides, by doing your own research, you're able to link information up and resonate with it in your own unique way, which is really what matters here. So the first thing we're going to talk about here is something I like to refer to as patterns, and not just any pattern, geometrical patterns, and what this really means. You see, patterns are found everywhere. They're all throughout nature. In fact, you could say that they're actually the building blocks of everything you know to be real. They're in your dog, they're in your house plans, they're in your, your house. They make up your body. They make up everything you know to be real in your life. Since everything can be reduced down to an atom, an atom itself is a geometrical structure. And that structure itself works with other structures, or against them, to create these objects that we see in front of us. Uh, the table, the computer, your chicken dinner, everything can be reduced down to a geometric structure. And at this level, it's all about if that structure works together with another to create a unit or if it moves apart to create something new. This is essentially a very basic way of experiencing separation or understanding separation. And what I mean by separation is the idea of me being here and you being there or my house being separate to the house across the road. However, as you will see, the idea of separation really is just an illusion. And the more you begin to see life in this way, the more life just begins flowing for no particular reason at all. Situations naturally work themselves out and problems just disappear. Not always, but sometimes to a level that completely amazes you for no particular reason. It just happens. And why would that happen, you might ask? You see, when you view life in this way, what you're doing is you're seeing it through a different perceptual lens. And what I mean here is you're starting to see things at a very basic foundational level, which is essentially a level of truth. And, and through here, you're actually accessing the level of source. And what I mean by source is literally the infinite, what physicists would call the zero-point field. The zero-point field is is basically a field of information. It is what you could call space that permeates everything. It's found in everything. It's found in your body, it's found in your cat, it's found in your breakfast. It's in between every particle. And in fact, the space between the particles is what allows that particle to communicate with another. They never really ever do touch, uh, you know, in contrast to probably what you were taught in school about this idea of particles bouncing against one another like little balls creating a chain reaction in this whole cause and effect thing isn't really necessarily the case when you start looking at the Planck length. In fact, when you have a moment, check out the Planck length if you don't already know it. It's essentially uh, the smallest space that you can get between one particle and another. There is an actual definitive space. So you could really see it as a form of truth that really nothing ever touches. It's the space in between which gives the effect or the illusion that things are touching. So therefore, space isn't really what it appears to be. So with that in mind, you can understand how something solid shows up in our reality, but it's not quite really the case. It all comes down to what I was talking about. Perception. It's how you see the world around you. I like to compare this concept with a camera. If you were to change the lens on a camera, you're changing your perception of the image you're looking at. You can put a filter on it. You can change the zoom. One lens is different from another the same as how you perceive reality. If you can get into an altered state or an altered perception to what you normally perceive your reality, then you have a whole different way of playing the game. What I'm saying here is that when you change your state of mind, it can really change the way how things play out. So what does this got to do with geometry? Well, if you can begin to see the geometric nature behind all of your problems, let's say uh, the pain in your left arm or in your shoulder or issues at work or problems with your spouse, then this gives you the advantage of a higher perspective, therefore the ability to see and or observe a different outcome. So this brings me to the main point of this video, uh, something called sacred geometry. To me, sacred geometry is the core pattern behind everything. It's how physical reality is structured. It is literally how everything is put together. 
And I have to say, each stage of what I'm about to show you, you can go into it so deep that you can spend you could spend years researching this information. So I'm just going to go and, and give you a, a, a brief overview of each, of each stage, just to give you an insight of what this really means. Uh, basically, a, a different perspective, as I've been talking about. So to begin with, we're going to have a look at the infinite. And right here is a representation of the infinite. It is space. It goes on forever. There literally is nothing yet to experience because nothing has been created. There is just foreverness and nothing more. And as you can tell, this is a really boring place because there is absolutely nothing to do. So we have to start somewhere. So let's make our first point of reference. This point represents infinite consciousness expressed as one. However, we're still bored because there's nothing to do. We can't go for a walk, we can't eat our dinner, we can't do any of that stuff because none of that stuff exists yet. There's nothing to do. So we need something to bounce off. We need something to experience. We need something to communicate with. We need something to learn from or to learn with. Otherwise, what's the point? So to have an experience, we need to create a second point of reference. Anywhere will do as we have not yet created the concept of distance. So here we go. So this dotted line here is showing that we have now created the idea of relation. We have something to experience. The dot is no longer bored because it now has a friend. And now these two friends can experience each other in their fullest way, as pure reflections of each other. And in this experience, we have created the idea of distance. And through this distance, we now have self-awareness. And because at this stage, awareness only goes as far as the reflection, we have now created ourselves a boundary. So if we were to trace a pathway around this boundary, as shown here, what you would get is a perfect circle. This circle represents the infinite self and the awareness of the self. You see, the circle is infinite because its boundaries are infinite. All, all shapes are, are defined by its angles and its faces, but if you were to measure the angles of a circle, you would get the number pi, a number that never ends. So what about a shape to represent the original infinite illusion? It's something that you can observe, you can see it, yet the boundaries are infinite. So when you try and find them, you never can. And unfortunately, this is a little bit how we look at our lives and some of the situations in our lives. We think we can see where the problem started or, or where it ends, but, but really, a lot of times when we actually start to observe those boundaries, we actually find that there's a lot more to it. And sometimes they appear to go on forever. And to think that your problems could go on forever might not be such a good thought at first, but really, when you think about it, the idea of forever, which is infiniteness, has no room for fear, because remember, fear was just the illusion that we created for ourselves in order to have the first experience. It was that first reflection. Fear had to be created in order to experience anything. So, back to the circle. Because we have created awareness through the second point, we can do the same thing again. And by doing this, we have now created two circles, along with something new. These two beings of awareness have created something called the Vesica Pisces. This shape is often referred to as the womb of creation. It represents creation, transformation, change, and bringing forth new life. You see, by creating the Vesica Pisces, using the two points that already exist, we have actually created two more, one at the top and one at the bottom, where the two circles intersect. And by connecting these points up, we get our first straight edge shape, the equilateral triangle. And not just one, we get two. A reflection, a little bit like the two circles, but now in the form of triangles. Essentially, a reflection within a reflection. This is also where you will first see the feminine giving birth to the masculine, which is really just like us. When we are in our mother's wombs, we will all first start out female, it's only at a later stage when our hormones kick in that we actually are decided that we, if we are going to continue being female or if we're going to develop into a male. But we always first start out being female. Anyways, going back to the observation that we have created two more points through the intersection of the circles. These two points are exact copies of the parents. And just like the parents, they are too self-aware because they have limitations. They realize that there is a boundary and they therefore can explore that and have a space within it. So we can create another circle, just like we did with the parents, and again, and again, until we end up back at the beginning. What we have here is something called the seed of life. The seed of life is a shape that represents 
uh, third dimensional reality through movement and spin. You see, if the central circle was white and all the surrounding circles were a different color of the rainbow, if you were to spin this really fast, you would have the perception of seeing white light. It's just an illusion. It's just how our eyes perceive this movement. So really, the key here is spin. And by spinning this object, what you also get is something called the tube torus. The tube torus can be seen as one of the most foundational shapes in existence. It is found everywhere. It's, it's, it's all through nature. It is the shape of the electromagnetic field of the body or the magnetic field of the Earth. Cut open an apple and you'll see the same shape. It's everywhere when you start looking for it. It's even in your box of donuts. You see, the tube torus is a pretty magical shape. It's the only shape that can fold in on itself and have the same properties of a circle because its boundaries grow on forever. It never ends. It's a, it's a shape of infiniteness, but in a whole different level. What's also created from the tube torus is the idea of a left spin and a right spin. Um, if you look up something called scalar physics or torsion field physics, you'll find a whole bunch of intense stuff on this. Um, but it really actually makes sense at the level we're talking about here. So another thing I'd like to mention about the seed of life and what is created with the seed of life is if you were to make this a third dimensional model instead of the two dimensional image you see here, we get something called the egg of life. Funny enough, this is a shape that we see in the first stages of uh, development in all multicelled organisms. And that means, that means you and everything that you know as an animal or a plant. But doesn't that make sense when this shape actually represents bringing you forth into the third dimension? So, going back to the 2D perspective, the seed of life. If we were to take and put another layer of circles around the outside in the same way that we did the first time, what we would get is something called the flower of life. The flower of life is a very ancient symbol and is found all over the world in ancient monuments and places of, of sacred interest everywhere. Um, in fact, I, I've even found it here in my local city of Leicester, here in the UK. Anyways, with the flower of life comes a variety of new symbols and concepts, including something called the tree of life. But I'm not really going to be covering that here because it's a, there's a lot of information to it. But what I'm going to say is that this uh, flower of life, I kind of see as more of a transition symbol to something new, to an idea of a new perception, a new way of observing reality. And, and that's kind of what it does, because like the seed of life into the flower of life, if we were to create a new set of circles all the way around, connecting up to points as, as we have done before, what we get is something called the fruit of life. Now, the fruit of life is usually shown like this, only showing these circles, but that's for a particular reason. Because if you were to take the center of each circle and connect them up with one another, what you would get is something called Metatron's Cube, which looks like this. Metatron's Cube could be considered the ultimate masculine aspect of structural reality, where the female counterpart would be the fruit of life, as we've seen before. Again, this is an example of a masculine form being born from a female form, just from a higher perspective. So the interesting thing with Metatron's cube is if you were to dissect this, you would get five subshapes, what's called the platonic solids. These five shapes are the five shapes that are literally the building blocks of physical reality. These are the only shapes in existence where all points will touch the inside of a sphere, along with all faces and all edges being equal to each other. There are other shapes out there that, that also have these properties, but they've only been created from cutting down the corners of these shapes, so still, these are the five original foundational shapes. Everything that you can experience around you, including the, the floor that you're standing on, or the computer that you're using, or the chair that you're sitting on, all are made of these shapes, uh, on a very, very basic, basic level. If you look at the elemental table, it has actually been found that every single element on the elemental table can be reduced down to one of these five platonic structures. Just by knowing this, I'm sure you can see how much power this information holds. So, the first platonic solid we're going to look at is the hexahedron, or as it's best known as, the cube. The cube represents solidity, power, control, the physical, really anything to do with structure. The cube is also highly associated with the element of Earth, and also the planet Saturn. There's a huge amount of information out there on the correlation between Saturn and the cube, and I'm probably going to do a future video on this, but for now we are just going to take note of that. 
So another thing I'd like to mention about a cube is how it is quite different from the rest of the platonic solids, and the fact that it could actually be seen as the father of all shapes, whereas the sphere is the mother of all shapes. Because the cube, like the sphere, will nestle all of the other platonic solids inside perfectly. Again, this is another expression of the masculine and feminine qualities of reality. The straight edges and angles of the masculine and the curves of the feminine. So the next shape we're going to look at here is the tetrahedron. Now the tetrahedron is usually shown in one of two ways, either on its own or with its twin, which is called the star tetrahedron. And this is one of the reasons that makes this shape special, because it is the only shape in the platonic solids shown within Metatron's cube that is inverted, where it's got a, it's got a twin, it's got a mirror which is quite reminiscent when we first came across the triangle from when we had the vesica pisces, because if you remember, it also had a twin. The tetrahedron, particularly when it's shown on its own, is considered also to be the closest shape to God, because it is the shape that has the smallest amounts of sides possible, so therefore it's the closest thing to the non-physical. The tetrahedron, like the triangle, represents creation, transformation, change, and even initiation. And the tetrahedron and triangles also have been long associated with the element of fire. In fact, you can even see this represented in modern day fire safety, where you have the fire triangle, which depicts the three elements of combustion. So the next shape we're going to look at is the octahedron. The octahedron is a shape that represents communication, mind, and thought. The shape is also associated with the element of air and also time itself. In fact, when you have a moment, check out what's called the Delta T antenna that was used in the Montauk project. And you'll see how this has uh, actually been used in the past to affect time and space. Very interesting stuff. Um, something else I'd like to mention is this: uh, there's, there's quite a lot on the internet to suggest that the Great Pyramids of Egypt aren't actually as they appear. They may actually be octahedrons, just half buried in the sand which would give a very different perspective of the energetic qualities that these things would, would hold and what they would project. So moving on, the next shape we have here is called the icosahedron. The icosahedron is a shape that represents nurture, the emotions, and is also associated with the element of water. In fact, this is the structure that's mapped across the planet that creates what's the original ley line structure. One of the first people to rediscover this information was a man called Ivan Sanderson, who was on a hunt to try and find where all the disappearances were across the planet, uh, such as places like, I'm sure you've heard of, Bermuda Triangle. Well, when he connected all these points up, what he found was a perfect inverted icosahedron. And within this icosahedron, you will find 12 triangles, which he calls the 12 vial vortices. The other thing I'd like to mention about the ley line structure is that how most ancient monuments, including the pyramids of Giza, Stonehenge, and, and, and most ancient or old churches and everything, are all lined up on this grid structure. It's as if the ancient civilization knew the energy that this, this uh, structure could harness. However, since then, the rest of platonic solids have also been added to create the full ley line structure that's, that's now studied today. If you do your research, you'll probably find all of these incorporated. So, moving on to the last of the platonic solids, the dodecahedron, what you'll find here is something a bit different. The only way we can express this shape through a two-dimensional perspective is by adding these lines here, which is a bit different to how we've actually created the other shapes. You see, technically, to get these lines, you have to make this shape three-dimensional. So therefore, this shape represents moving in to another dimension. It represents the ether, and it represents the cosmos and space. Funny enough, actually, scientists have, uh, in recent years, discovered that by measuring background radiation from the Big Bang, they actually are now starting to believe that the universe could be in the shape of a dodecahedron. And somehow, I don't think it's a coincidence. So, anyway, that is the last of the platonic solids. So... Really, how does this information help you in everyday life? Well, when you have a moment, sit back, take a look at your situations, take a look at everything in your life, and just reflect on it and see if you can actually match some kind of geometric concept with it. One way or another, you will eventually be able to match everything geometrically. And by having a perspective like this over your problems, you start to see them in a different light. They start reacting differently. They don't really become problems anymore. They just become either messengers or they just become experiences. 
It's all about a learning experience rather than about hindrances. So I hope you got something out of this. I hope this made a little bit of sense. And if it didn't, oh well, watch it again. Why not? The more times you watch something, it makes more sense sometimes. I'm sure you've, you've watched a few films like that. You've had to watch it three or four times to really get the whole storyline. Well, this can be kind of like that. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed the video. And if you'd like more information about this or more information about sessions or training, please visit my website. I'll put the link below in the description. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you again soon.